Hello, everyone. My name is Felina. I'm assistant professor at Delft University of Technology. And what it says on the program is that I'll do the talk how to teach programming and other things. But that is fake news. I have changed my mind and therefore have declared the program to be erroneous, wrong. This is not the talk I'm going to give. I, I'm going to give a new talk because I did this talk already twice last week. So I was like, nah, I'm not sure I can bring the right energy to do that talk again. So I compiled the new talk today. If you really, really were looking forward to how to teach programming and other things, we can just skip right to the end, the end, and you can leave, it's okay. You can leave, you can go to my website and there's a video of this talk online. So if you really wanna see it, this is your chance to just leave, <laughs> take your laptop and look at the talk I was going to give. No takers? Okay, fair enough. So what I am going to talk about today is this thing that I call code phonology, which means how do people speak code? How do they hear code? How does source code sound if you read it aloud? But before I'm going to talk about that, I am going to give you a little bit of a backstory into how I got into this research topic. And just to confuse people that have seen my other talks, the first few minutes of this talk will actually be the same as the first part of how to teach programming and other things. But don't worry, after a few minutes, it will diverge. So to keep you awake, I have some audience participation. Who knows who said this? Everyone should learn how to program. Who said this? Every programmer ever. Are you someone who's seen my talk? So every programmer ever. Right? We all love programming. So many people say, oh, programming is the best. Everyone should learn how to program. We all say this. However, it leads to an interesting question because if we apparently believe that everyone should program, what is programming? What do we mean if we say everyone should learn programming? What is the skill level? What is the programming language? What, what, do we, wh what do we even teach them? And you might think that what is programming is a super easy question, but it's actually a pretty hard question. If you ask 10 people what is programming, probably you'll get 10 different answers. And if we would ask people what programming is, we would probably ask people like us, like other programmers. And we programmers, we might not be the best people to answer this question. And that's maybe best explained by the story about three fish in the sea. They're swimming, maybe you, you know the story. And the big fish says, hey fox, how's the water? So he asks the two small fishies, how's the water? And the two small fish, they say, what's water? Fish don't know what water is because the only thing they've ever been in is water. So for them, water is synonymous with everything, with the world, with the universe. And we programmers, we're a little bit like that. The only water we know is programming. Most people program not only as their profession, but also as a hobby. Lots of people have friends that are also programmers. So we're in this water of programming all the time. And maybe that makes us not the best people to decide what programming is and also what isn't programming. Because if we say this is programming, that also means some other things aren't programming. And to really understand my perspective on what is and what isn't programming, let me take you back to the year 2008 when I started my PhD project. So I moved from Eindhoven, this is in the tiny country of the Netherlands, to Delft. It's a really small move, it's like 100 kilometers, but for someone from a tiny country, that's a big move. So I went to TU Delft, the university where I still work today, and I started a PhD project. And the research question for this PhD project, the research question that my supervisor had in mind was, was let's research a DSL, a domain-specific language for finance. So what we envisioned was a programming language, a little bit like COBOL, in which end user programmers, normal people, could express their business rules and therefore they would rely less on programmers to make software because they could make their own software, which is nice. So the first thing I did in my PhD project is I did an internship at a Dutch insurance company to figure out what are people doing in finance? What would be the keywords and the things that would need to go in such a domain-specific language? And what they learned me in university, I'm not sure if this is still true, if they still teach this to kids in university, but I just had my master's degree, and they sort of said, this is how the world looks like. You have users, and then there's a wall, and then there are programmers. 
They are different species. They sometimes communicate a little bit, but these type of people have nothing to do with each other. And the programmers program and the users use. That's it. That's how the world looks like. At least this is my 20-year-old naive view. This is how things go. People need stuff and the programmers make it. This illusion was quickly shattered when I started this internship at this insurance company because it turned out everyone was programming. The programmers were programming and also the normal people were programming. However, it wasn't that they were programming in a traditional textual language as me and my supervisor envisioned. No, they were programming in spreadsheets. Those normal people, they could program. They didn't really need the programmers at all. They were pretty well equipped with spreadsheets that they used for financial modeling and risk assessments. They were, they were doing fine, really. So I went back to my supervisor, I said, friend, they don't need a DSL in finance. They have a DSL in finance. It's called Excel. <laughs> it's a pretty good thing. We're never going to be able in a four year PhD project or however long we work on this to be able to come up with something that is going to outperform spreadsheets for what those people need. So the motto of my PhD dissertation be became spreadsheets are code. And they're not just code. Spreadsheets are really, and I say this without any irony, spreadsheets are the best programming language that has ever existed in the history of programming. Spreadsheets are such a good programming language, people don't know that they're programming. I mean, imagine doing Java by accident. <laughs> uh, imagine this conversation. Hey Frank, what are you doing? Well, I opened up Eclipse, it was installed on my laptop, and it was so intuitive. I just jumped right into it, and now I built this risk assessment model. No one ever. <laughs> but it's funny how weird that sounds, but for spreadsheets it's totally true. They are so intuitive that people just open it up and figure out what to do. They know what to do, and they, they can teach it to themselves and be pretty proficient. So it's, it's really an amazing programming language. It's not just a programming language, it has all the buzzwords. So maybe you never thought of it like this, but spreadsheets are functional programming. <coughs> a formula in a spreadsheet can only take inputs from other cells in the spreadsheet and calculate the results based on that. So it, it, a formula in a cell cannot change other cells. So it's pure, pure functional programming, it's side effect free. It's not just functional, it's also reactive. If you update a cell in a spreadsheet, only the part of the spreadsheet is recalculated that depends on this cell. So spreadsheets are reactive, pure functional programming, and yet 750 million people can use it. Eat that, Haskell. <laughs> so spreadsheets are code. This is w my story. It was a summary of my, my thesis, and I went to all these conferences around the world to talk about that. And it also gave me my thesis, my dissertation. So that was a happy story. I did all this research on spreadsheets and I graduated, hooray. However, <coughs> that's only part of the story. <laughs> In a previous version I did of this talk, someone said that this talk was just Felina doing therapy with an audience. <laughs> true, it's true. So this part about yeah, all the research I did, it's definitely true, but it's only the part of the story of the brain. And there's also the part of the story of the heart. Like, how was I feeling while I was doing this? So I went to all these conferences, just like this, where I like speaking, and I was like, oh, hello, hello, people, spreadsheets are code, have you heard? Spreadsheets are code, it's like, cool. And people be like, yeah, it's not real programming. I'm like, wait, 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 hold on a second. But it's functional, and it's reactive, and everyone can use it, and it's not real programming. And this, you know, it went on and on, and after a while, it just, it really drags you down. I mean, we can laugh about it now, but it's really tiring if people keep saying what you're doing is not real programming, like there's some sort of law, there's some sort of rule that this is programming and that's not programming and you're in, in the wrong side of programming. And I don't know if there are people that did a PhD in the audience, but especially for your thesis work, the topic and you sort of merge into one thing. And if people don't think your topic is very serious, it's really, really hurtful. And you know, I broke my heart after a while. I was just I really didn't want to work on it anymore. I didn't want to talk about it anymore. It's like pfft, I give up. And I really thought at this point that this is the normal way that people interact with each other. That if you're just part of a professional community, people will shit on your work and they will hate whatever you do. 
I thought that was normal. <laughs> it's not funny, actually. So it was only until later, like 2015, when I realized that other people in other communities are not shit to each other. <laughs> so I also very much like running, and after a while I went to races, and now I, I joined a, a running group, and everyone is nice to each other. So I have friends that are twice as quick runners as I am, but they don't say that I'm not a real runner. They're like, oh, let's go to a race together. They just wait an hour until I've also finished. <laughs> but they don't make jokes about that. And coming from programming, it's just amazing. No one disses each other's ability or tools. Everyone's just, oh, we love running. Runners are terrible that way. We are more evangelistic than Jehovah's Witnesses. If I see you jogging to the bus, I'll be like, oh, do you like running? Do you want to go to a race together? We want everyone to run. We would never say you're not a real runner for using the wrong shoes or using the wrong training schedule. And it's awesome, and it's not just running. I'm also a knitter, and I didn't knit for a while. I, I knitted a lot when I was a teenager, and then I went back to knitting after a few years, and I went to a meetup with old-fashioned straight needles that, you know, my mother and my grandmother use these things, but apparently they're not in fashion anymore. Everyone now uses circular needles. I didn't know. So I go to this meetup, and everyone has different needles. I'm like, oh, shit, they're going to say, you're not a real knitter, and I will cry again. No, no, no. But it wasn't anything like that. They were like, oh, you still have those old needles? You know, we used to have the, those needles. It's fine. We can teach you. No one said, oh, your old needles, they have security vulnerabilities. You can't use them anymore. <laughs> it was so welcoming. And, and there's so many welcoming communities. And then if you look back at programming, it's really like, what are we doing to each other? Why, why are we so mean? Why are we making this division between programming, and real programming, and not real programming? It's, it's weird. We should be like basically any other community except for programming. <laughs> Anyway, going back to 2012, I was not very happy. I didn't want to work on my research anymore, but I just accepted a professorship at TU Delft, so I had to do research because I told my uh, hiring committee lies, that, like I told you about the talk I was going to give. <laughs> I said, no, I'm going to do lots of spreadsheet stuff because I'm really excited because, I mean, it was what gave me my PhD and I didn't have any other ideas. So I was stuck in this position. I was supposed to show how good of a researcher I was, and I didn't want to do spreadsheets anymore. And I also, I was sad, so I mean, it wasn't a great time. However, by total coincidence, through people I knew, I got in touch with people that needed a programming teacher at a local community center on Saturdays. And they said, we have some kids, they want to learn programming, and we need a teacher. So I was like, I could probably do that. And Initially, it really wasn't my intention to turn those kids into research objects. It was really my intention to do something fun and useful on Saturdays, but I, I got intrigued <laughs> in, hey, if we want to teach kids programming, how do we do that? W what, what is the way we teach programming? And ultimately, it became my main line of research, so everything was fine in the end. I started teaching there, and this, this really interesting thing happened. When I started teaching, I think that's true for most people my age, is that if we think back of how we learn programming, it's like this. So I'm thinking of myself as a 10-year-old. We had a computer, and I was like by myself. I had some books from the library, basic books. If you tell this to 18-year-olds now, they, they think you're 100 years old. <laughs> I had paper books that I got from the library, that I took them to my home. And then I typed all the letters from the book into the computer. How did you know it was correct, miss? You had no internet. We just kept trying and trying and trying. And this is, I mean, it's a great story. I love telling people, oh, I taught myself programming when I was 10. But the fact that this is how many of us remember how we learned programming, it really impacts how we see programming education. Because notice there's no teacher in this story. So if I think back of what is a programming lesson, the only frame I have, and I think this is true for the broader programming community, is I was by myself and I had a book. So we don't have a collective image of how to teach programming because most of us were never in a programming class until we were in university. And then we were like, yeah, we know these things because we've been doing it for a decade. 
And this is interesting because if you think of other things that you learn, like you learn to write, or you learn to read, or you learn math, or you learn to even to ride a bike, you have this memory of oh, your parents took you to, to the park, and you have a frame of reference for how programming, uh, how biking education looks like, or, or writing education. We have no collective memory of how programming education looks like. And that is, I mean, maybe it's an opportunity because we can figure it out, but because we don't really talk about this a lot, it sort of turns into accidentally recreating your own programming history. At least that was, that was the case for me. So how I thought I should teach them is like, okay, they can figure out everything because they're like me. Obviously, every child is like me. So they can figure out everything. We, we just focus on the hard parts. So I just have to explain them um, mutability and in out parameters, but all the rest, all the details, they will figure it out because I was like that. But clearly not all kids are like the people that can teach themselves programming. So many of my programming lessons, and also if you examine materials of people that are teaching, are very much about concepts. So I want to teach kids about repetition. I tell them a loop is repetition. This is the programming concept, the conceptual stuff. And what we don't talk about is, yeah, it really matters where the semicolon goes or the colon or the bracket. We tend to not talk about syntax that much because we all learn different books and that's the easy stuff. And the compiler or the interpreter will tell you, let's talk about the concepts. But it was pretty hard. So it was really hard to get kids to do stuff. And I, I observed them, and also this is what you observe also in university level students, really struggling with syntax, not knowing where a bracket goes. And you have this whole plan in mind. Oh, I'm going to calculate all the prime numbers. And I have a plan. And then the compiler says, no, the bracket is wrong. And pfft, your whole plan is gone because all your energy goes into syntax. So it's like, hmm, why is it so hard? I should read some research about programming syntax. So there's this amazing person that you should all like look him up on the internet. He's called Andreas Stapik. He's cool. He did actual experiments into how people read programming languages. So he tried it with novices. He gave them different programming languages and he started to actually me measure what works. So he had about 100 university level student novices in programming, and he taught them programming in different programming languages. So he gave them exercises in Java, Perl, Python, and Ruby, say traditional programming language. And in addition to those four languages, he also included two other programming languages he designed. So Quorum is a programming language he designed to be as good, as user-friendly as possible. But he also included Randomo, it is what you think it is. It is a programming language with randomly generated keywords. <laughs> they make no sense. So you give 100 students these six programming language, languages, and you see where do they do better. So clearly, Randomo didn't do great. But it did better than Java and Perl. <laughs> Quorum, Python, and Ruby did better than Randomo. So let me put that on a slide for you so you can all really see it. <laughs> Novice programmers do better in a randomly generated programming language than they do in Java or Perl. This is how bad we are at inventing programming languages. I mean, unlike with the real program, it's funny, but it's also very sad. This is where we are as an industry. And this, this work is not from the 80s. This work is from 2012 when for the first time someone, this amazing person, thought, hey, maybe it's a super good idea if we actually check what people get from our programming languages. That, that's where we are. So lots of work to do. That's, that's the good news. The story here is that syntax is not intuitive. It's not this thing that people can just pick up and then they will quickly be able to do conceptual stuff. As I said, it's true for many of the people that are here now, but that doesn't mean it's good. We're, we've all been Stockholm syndromes by how bad our programming languages are. It's not that they're in intuitive. We've just learned how to work with it because there was no YouTube when I was 10 year old, so I had this basic book to entertain me. It's not because it's, it's intuitive and good. So we can't assume that kids will, or, or even adults will just pick it up because it makes so much sense. It makes very little sense. So this is the part of the what. 
I was interested, okay, I should somehow sp spend effort on teaching kids syntax. That's what I need to do. But I didn't really knew how to do it. How do you practice syntax in a good way? How do I get them to remember where, where does the semicolon go? Where does the bracket go? How do I do that? How? How was the, the question? And then I, I met this other amazing person. This is because I hang out at conferences all the time where lots of amazing people hang out. So another amazing person, uh, Alexandra West, she was actually together with uh, her partner that is a software developer. So she came to the conference as a plus one. So she's not just an amazing person, she's an amazing person with an art degree. And we were at this conference in Paris together, sitting outside in a sunny, sunny night in Paris. And we started talking about what, what is art like? It's like, oh, tell me about your art degree and what do you do? And of course, I frame everything because I'm, a, I'm a in the water of programming, everything in terms of programming. So we started to talking about what would happen if we would view source code as artworks. If we would do review of a code review, like art criticism. I mean, you hang it on the wall, you look at it. I mean, th there were really interesting perspectives in this part of the story where you would just print out your source code and you would, you would just look at it for a while. And you just, this, this is apparently how people review art or crit criticize art. You look at it, oh, you do something else. You, you go back, you let it sink in a bit. You ask yourself, what does this make me remember? And we started thinking, how, how, why don't we do that for code? Just look at it for a bit, do something else. How does this make me feel? It's interesting. So that in itself, I mean, that could be a whole other talk. But I also started thinking, what would happen if we would create code as we would create artworks? I mean, code is an amazing tool, but the only thing we do with source code now is we use it to represent things that are already in the world. But um, very much like a realistic painting, but we could have other forms of, I mean, notice the wine going from the glasses. It was also a really interesting conversation. So like, yeah, but you could have cubic code and brutalist code and Rococo code. We could encode all these styles in code. How would that look like if you have the same algorithm, but the one is pointillism and the other one is surrealism? What does it even mean? Yay, more wine. Anyway, I managed to get this accepted as a workshop at the Booster Conference, which is a, a very, very nice conference because I send in random proposals and they're like, that sounds fun. It was five lines of the garbage I was just saying after the wine, oh, code, co art. But they were like, yeah, let's do it. So I'm like, oh shit, now I have to do it. So I did the workshop and it was really very fun. So the people that participated in the workshop, they said, oh, this was really fun because I just asked them these questions like, write a cubistic quicksort. They have fun, but I wasn't really happy because they didn't really create anything. There was lots of discussion, people were doing things, but there wasn't pretty art that I could sell to a museum or anything. And the reason I think that that happened is one of the things we did in the beginning of the workshop, I thought, let's start easy. Let's not go to visual art immediately. Let's start with doing some poems in source code because poetry and code are still relatively similar. So we first do a poem and then we can do the paintings. So the paintings never happened because we totally got stuck on the poems. One of the exercises that you need to do if you want to write a poem for the right meter, like if you have a limerick, it's always like So you need to know the number of syllables in a line of code. I thought about this, but I thought, you know, ah, it's pretty easy. These are slides from the actual workshop. So we said, oh, you for example, this line, def, bubble, sort, a, list, it's six syllables. And I said, well, you know, sometimes maybe it can be confusing because if you have an equal sign, it could be is or equals or becomes, but just pick one. It doesn't really matter what you do there. <laughs> Big mistake. This oh, just pick one strategy didn't work at all because we worked in groups and the group's like, oh, sure, we'll just take is for assignment. And then they always like, no, we won't. No, that's ridiculous. It's not an is. It's a, it's an equal sign. And you will say, no, no. They come up with new suggestions that weren't even in my slide. No, it's stores. No, it's assigns too. No, it's sets too. So the workshop 
was interesting, as I said, the people were having fun debating how keywords were, be were called or how it would sound. They thought that exercise was fun and useful. I'm like, I want to have a painting. But I learned a lot from this because something I thought was trivial, just reading a line of source code aloud, turned into a new line of research. These things sometimes happen. I was like, wow, we have no clue how to pronounce code as a community. We just haven't figured this out. The people have opinions. But we don't know. This is apparently not something we have decided as a community. So I read the entire handbook of reading, which is, it's really stretching the definition of a handbook. It has 500 words. I, I have trouble holding this in two hands, but it's really very interesting. It's, it makes you, again, happy and sad at the same time, because if you read it, you're like, wow, the reading community has figured out how stuff works. They know everything from every age level. They know, well, if a kid is four, they read like this, they speak like that. If they are six, then this, all the stages have names and this happens. I'm like, whoa, we're programming, we know nothing. We don't have any hypotheses or theories about what happens in people's brains when they're reading code. Uh, we could do experiments like Andreas did, which is great for the type of experiment he wanted to do, but if he wanted to do something with, with pronunciation, we lack the theory to even do an experiment. It's like, it makes you sad and happy at the same time. There's so much research into reading. You have these distinct phases through which kids go if they're learning to read. So if you have a five or a six or a seven year old at home, initially they're only focused on the letter. So they can't really read words or sentences. The only thing they can do is b, u, k, book. And then they can read words in at once. So book in shelf, cat in tree. But they're reading and they don't really have a conception yet. It's really funny if you have kids of this age, you, they can read like cat, cat, in, in, tree. So where is the cat? And they're like, oh, I don't know. They're reading, but all their mental energy is spent on the letters and the words, so they don't have energy left to consider the meaning. Only after a while, we, we adult prof provisional readers, we can just say, oh, Book is book, it happens immediately. You don't spend any energy anymore on reading. And reading has really figured all these levels out. And it's not just for kids that sounds really matter. Even if you're a proficient reader of your own native language, still how something sounds is very important to you. So let's do an experiment because I know it's like six, so <laughs> everyone's tired. So another audience participation moment. We will do reading sentences from the slide. So it's very easy. I'll show you a sentence like this. There is a cat in the tree. And if you've read it, you raise your hand. So you can do it silently. You don't have to do it aloud. If you've read it, you raise your hand. We'll do a, a test first because there's a, there's a tiny caveat. I'll do it in two steps. So it's like, there is a cat in the tree. And then you raise your hand. Do you want to do a practice round? Everyone ready? I, and I wouldn't be speaking it anymore. Perfect. Here's another one. <laughs> Something happened in your brain, right? So apparently how words sound matter when you're reading. And this second sentence, if you try this with people, this was in the uh, Oxford Handbook of Reading, people are slower in these types of sentences because some people have read, there is a tear, and then, oh shit, in my pants, that's weird, oh, it's tear. <laughs> so you have to go back and, and it takes more time. So even if you're a proficient reader, these type of sentences take longer. And they did experiments also where the words changed meaning but not sound. Like the word calf, it can mean little cow but also part of your leg. So there were sentences like uh, she heard her calf and then in the shed or in the gym. And the effect there was way less than with these type of words. So it's not about that it changes meaning, it's about that it changes sound because you're sounding out the words in your brain. And there are people that really want to do speed reading. The first thing they have to do is not sound out the words. This sounding out is called subvocalization. 
And it takes lots of energy, apparently, to suppress the instinct or the practice we had in subfocalization. It's very hard to not do it, and this example, I think, nicely shows that. So when words sound ambiguously, comprehension suffers. And that immediately leads to the question, what about keywords? If keywords sound ambiguously, if it's really hard to know how to sound something, does comprehension suffer? It's likely that a programming language is still a language. It's very likely that we, to a certain extent, sound out subvocalized code as well. But because we have no consistent model, maybe we could do it better if you would practice that. We asked 10 kids, these are high school children, to read out a bunch of code snippets for us in a systematic way. So we told them, you have to do your programming homework, but your computer is broken. So you're on the phone with a friend, and they're going to type up your homework. And a friend knows programming, so you can assume that they sort of know what it's about, but they don't know what they have to do, so you have to tell them. We gave them exercises like this, x, x equals signs five, and they are all over the place, just like the professionals in the first in the coding art workshop. Equals five, gets five, sets to five, assign five to x, all over the place. They have no consistent story of how it sounds like. We did another study where we had 22 professional developers do the same exercises as we presented with the kids. It was the exact same story, all over the place, and we discussed the answers with among the group, so my idea was there to reach some sort of consensus that we could convince other people that that pronunciation wasn't the most logical, that entirely failed. People would really cling to how they thought it would be pronounced. And the interesting thing was that some people even were inconsistent between code snippets. So in the one they said x and in one uh, equals, and the other one they said x equals five. They sometimes did weird things with variable names. We had a variable temperature, and some people said the temperature is set to five, but they didn't do that, of course, with the single letter variables. It was apparently a very, very hard task just to read code aloud. And these 10 novices in the previous experiments were interesting. They were novices, but they were also Dutch. So these are Dutch high school children, they're about 12, so they have had two or three years of English education. They're definitely not proficient in English. And we didn't think of that, we just picked Dutch kids because they're close everywhere in the Netherlands. <laughs> but the native tongue really plays a role in these code snippets. So the letter I, if you would read it in English, is I, I as in Thai, but if you read this letter in Dutch, we don't say I, we say E, E as in creep. That's how we say this letter. We had kids mispronounce the variable within one code snippet or doing it in different ways. So they said things like for E in range, print I. In the same snippet, they would call the variable a different name. And we didn't do any measurements of their cognition, but it's very likely that if they don't pronounce it in the same way, in their brain it hasn't clearly registered that this is the same variable. And we observed the teachers too, and they were really inconsistent. Sometimes when they were reading the code, usually when they were reading from the screen, they would say things like print I, because it makes sense, because print is an English word, so you would also say I in the English way. But then if they were having conversations with kids in Dutch, oh, teach, what variable do I pick? And then the teacher would say, oh, it's E because normally we call the letter E. Super confusing, and we didn't think about this natural language effect at all, which is weird because I myself pronounced the word array as array until I was in university because I got it from a book and I didn't know how to say it. So I should have thought of, hey, it's very hard to pronounce keywords. In another, who is Dutch in the audience? In another amazing example that will only make sense to the Dutch people, we had a kid that pronounced Weil as Wille. <laughs> and this makes sense, he had an argumentation even. He said it makes sense because Wille in Dutch, it means wheels and it goes round like a loop. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So they didn't know how to pronounce it and then they come up with their own imagination of why a word means something is very hard to correct because it was in his brain, it was wheel and it makes sense. So wh what are you talking about with your while? 
The conclusion here is we should tell kids how to pronounce source code if we want them to do it in a consistent way, likely freeing up mental space. So you should really, if you're teaching, do things like repeat after me, X is five. This is how you say it. And even for harder programming concepts like a loop, we should say for I in range. This is how the words sound, especially for non-English kids, but probably also for English kids. It's very helpful to know how stuff sounds because then they can sub-focalize it and probably spend less energy on reading the code. Practicing this helps. We did a study, again with Dutch kids, where half of the kids, we got them a lesson in which they were saying code out loud all the time. Every week we taught them a new syntax concept and we said, this is how you say it. It's really cool. We said it as a group for I in range. It was a really nice exercise. And the other group was a control group, so they just got a random programming lesson, a normal one in which we didn't do any of those focalization exercises. And the first group did better on syntax questions than the second group. And if I would present this work to elementary school teachers or high school teachers, they'd be like, yeah, of course, saying stuff aloud is how you make kids remember things. Like the tables of multiplication, most people that learn the tables of multiplication in school is like two times three is six until it's really in your brain. This isn't rocket science, but as I was referring to in the beginning, because we don't have this collective memory of how a programming lesson looks like, the basic things, like if you want kids to remember stuff, you make them sound it out. It's just not in our collective memory. But of course, if we want to have what I call a code phonology, a way of pronouncing code, if we want to do this for kids, we have to agree on how the things are called. That's going to be the hardest part. So my proposal to programming language designers is that with their syntax, they will say how the keywords are called. Put it in your language specification. I don't care about what you pick. Other people will, I don't. I just want to have an answer for how everything sounds like so we can use it in education. And it's probably going to be very, very hard to get people to this point, but it's really important that this is, that there's a system on how to do it. And I think the impact of this is going to be way bigger than just education. As I said, it's going to be really cool for lessons if, we, if I say in a classroom, X gets five, and I know that the kids are thinking of the right programming concepts. That's going to be super powerful in teaching. But there are lots of other ways in which this is going to help. For example, pair programming. If you've done pair programming, maybe even remote pair programming, you're like, ah, oh, type a bracket. Huh, a bracket? No, I mean a round bracket. This is conversations people have. Apparently, if you're pairing with someone that is not a native programmer in that language and doesn't know where the brackets go in Java, but also, again, this has to do with people that use English as their second language. I don't know how you call all the symbols. You don't know how you call the symbols. Is it a pound? Is it a hashtag? Figure it out, English. We have good words for this. So it's very confusing, and all the energy that's that that we spend on, yeah, but what symbol? Oh, a double equal, a single equals, a triple equals, is all not going into making programs. So if you just figure this out, it will be super useful. And there's one other group that I care about actually a lot that could definitely benefit from a good way of speaking code, and that's people that are blind or visually impaired. The way that people that are blind or visually impaired process text, any text, is with a screen reader. So it just reads the text. And they're pretty good, they're free ones and open source ones. These are the things people use. But those things are made for natural language because there aren't that many blind programmers. So if you read something like this, it will read it like this, dev underscore underscore init underscore underscore, which is terrible. And this isn't even the worst example. It gets worse because if you have something like this, it will read out Harry, and then a pause because it's adults, and then name. This is how screen readers read because normally if you're reading normal text, you don't want to say dots, or hear dots at the end. You want to hear a pause. And it's very hard to calibrate them to be able to read source code. So if we would just figure out the phonology, we could put that 
understanding into these type of programs. And then people that are blind could also conveniently read source code rather than do it in a very annoying way. And the opposite might be true as well. People that don't have control of their arms anymore, they could speak the source code because we have a consistent understanding and then that might make their lives easier. That's it, that's everything I wanted to share. Allow me to summarize my entire talk in, well, let's say, 30 seconds. There isn't any room for Q&A because we have to leave this room because this is where PubConf is going to be and I was told to ask you to all go out of the room so they can prep it and change it into a real pub and then come back. So we're not going to do Q&A, but I will be at PubConf as well. So if you want to ask me questions, you can totally do it after my summary or tomorrow as well. My talk was about how does code sound, which is interesting because we don't really have a good conception of what programming is and what programming education is, mainly because we hang out in programming and with programmers all the time, so we don't really know how it works. Secondly, if you just take one thing from this talk, don't be those people. <laughs> don't be those people, it's terrible. If, if a VB6 programmer comes to your meetup, like, hello, I'm new here, what do you program? VB6, you will say, welcome, sir, this is great, come in, tell me about your beautiful language. Don't tell them it's not a real programming language. If people say they're programming, they're programming. What we know from how people perceive natural language is that it really matters how words are sounding because you subfocalize in your brain and it's a trick that's very, very hard to diminish. So it's very likely that if you're reading source code, you also, to a certain extent, subfocalize. So it really matters how our keywords sound. If we ask people, both novices but also professionals, to read code aloud, they do it in a non-systematic, non-consistent way, so this is not a solved problem. An extra complication happens when people don't speak English as a first language and they confuse the pronunciation of keywords because they alternate between their natural native language and English. We tried it and it turns out it actually helps, even though of course it was a small first study, but it actually helps if you teach kids how things sound. If you practice it, then they will remember better. So go back home, tell your favorite language designer to get their shit together and give us a phonology. I don't care what you pick, but just pick one so we can use it in education and as I said, potentially also in tools for the blind, in tools for pair programming, in tools for people that cannot use their hands anymore. That's it. I will ask, answer a few questions that I always answer. If you want to know more about my research, you can go to my website where there are videos of all my talks and my research. I'm on Twitter as well. I made these slides with an app called GoodNotes. Yes, I did draw them by hand on my iPad. And if you want to listen to me more because you enjoyed this talk, I'm also a host of the SE Radio podcast. So if you're like, ah, oh, I would like to hear more from Felina, that's a, a good way to learn more about me and the guests that we interview on the show. And thanks to a bunch of people that are amazing, the end. <laughs>